Good morning. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. I want to make mention first thing this morning that this coming Saturday, June 20th at 6.30 p.m. is our next Victorious Faith Seminar in North Denver in Thornton. And so we will be meeting at the Holiday Inn Express and Suites in Thornton. That is one block east of I-25 on 120th Avenue and Grant Street on the northeast corner of 120th and Grant Street. And so the address is 12030 Grant Street, Thornton, Colorado, 80241. That would be the Holiday Inn this Saturday in Thornton. And we're going to be preaching a word that will build your faith to receive from God the promises that he has given you to encourage you, to inspire your hope and and, and faith again in to receive and that God is going to perform those things that he has promised you. So I encourage you, if you live in northern Colorado or northern Denver, to come to this meeting in Thornton this Saturday and build your faith up. We would love to meet you. So if you're a Westminster or North Glen or Thornton or Commerce City, Boulder, Longmont, any of those areas in the north, then please come and join us this Saturday at 6.30 p.m. in Thornton at the Holiday Inn. And for more information, you can go to my website at www.victoriousfaith, V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, F-A-I-T-H dot C-O, C-O just like Colorado. And you can go to the itinerary page. You'll see the details and also a link for the map and directions. So please join us this Saturday in Thornton at 6.30 p.m. And now we are starting a new series, which is a sequel, a sequel series to the extensive six-month series that we did called The Law of Spiritual Authority. We just finished that. We are now beginning a sequel to that. And this will be going through different things that you will need to know and understand. Um, I'm going to, we're calling it this week, the spiritual battle, the spiritual battle. Now, when we started the series about six or seven months ago called the law of spiritual authority, I took time one week and we did it a week called Know your enemy, know your enemy. And that is very important because if you don't know who your enemy is, then you are probably going to strike out at the wrong person. And that is not good. And you won't win if you are fighting the wrong person. And so, you know, a lot of Christians don't really understand clearly who their enemy is. And many times... They start to blame God. You know, blaming God seems to be one of the first reactions that people have when they're angry or hurt about way, the way things have gone or, or something that happened. If they're angry or hurt, one of the first things many people do is get angry at God. God, why did you let this happen? Why do you let these things happen to me? And that attitude, which is, like I said, it's a first reaction of many people. But it is a wrong reaction because God is not your problem. God is not your enemy. God is not the one who hurt you. And it's not because of God. God did not send it and God didn't really technically allow it. And if you missed that teaching, we talked about that in our last series, the law of spiritual authority. And we did that early on. It was probably December or January, but we spent the time, know your enemy, know who the devil is and what he does. 
what are his tactics, know who God is and what he does and what are his tactics. And if you think God is doing you harm, then you are totally messed up and wrong in your thinking. Because John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, who is the thief? Well, you know, religiously speaking, that it's Satan. But practically speaking, do you know it's Satan? Then why when things, some, when there is something stolen, killed, or destroyed, do so many people say, God, why did you do that? Or why did you allow it? It wasn't God, it was the thief. Satan is the thief, always has been and always will be. Jesus went on to say in John 10, 10, but I have come that you might have life more abundantly. And that word more abundantly in the Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek. In the Greek, the word more abundantly in John 10, 10, life more abundantly is the same word used in Ephesians 3.20, where in Ephesians 3.20, he said, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think. Exceeding abundantly in Ephesians 3.20 is the same Greek word as more abundantly in John 10.10. And it means to the highest degree, far over and above, superior and surpassing. Jesus said, I came to give you life to the highest degree. Life that is far over and above. Life that is superior and surpassing. So he said the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, but... That word, but is a contradiction, but I have come to give you life more abundantly, life to the highest degree, life that is um, far over and above, life that is superior and surpassing. That is the life Jesus came to give you. Nothing that has ever hurt you was God's will for you. I say that again. Nothing, nothing, nothing that has ever, ever hurt you was God's will for you. Never. God has never wanted you hurt. That's why Jesus died on the cross. He was nailed and pierced in his hands and his feet, his side and the thorns on his head in order to redeem you from death, sin, And the curse, all hurt, all harm. That's why Jesus died for you. Don't ever question his love for you because he loved you so much. He took your sin. He loved you so much. He took your sickness. He loved you so much. He took your poverty. I'm, I'm quoting scripture. I'm quoting scripture. Second Corinthians 5, 21 he was made to be sin for you. First Peter five eight. He bore your. I mean, First Peter two twenty four. Getting scriptures mixed up. First Peter two twenty four is he bore your sins, and by his stripes you were healed. You were healed. Matthew eight seventeen. He himself carried your diseases and bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases. Also, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he was made poor so that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. These are all scriptures that relate to what we call the great exchange. Again, I did a series on that one more than a year ago, and that was called Resurrection Week. Resurrection Week, it was a five-week series about the great exchange what Jesus did on the cross for you, what Jesus did on the cross for you. Yes, you've probably heard it, but I even think that if you would listen to that five week series, you would learn something that you never knew before that you never heard before. And you would understand even more fully what Jesus really did for you. But we see in that teaching, the great exchange, how he took everything bad, To give you everything good. 
He took all the curse to give you the blessing. He took sickness to give you healing. He took poverty to give you blessing, increased riches and prosperity. He was rejected so that you could be accepted. He was ashamed and shamed and disgraced in order for you to receive honor and glory. He was spit upon so that you could be shown honor. He went to hell so you could go to heaven. There was all of that and more that took place in the great exchange. Don't ever think that Jesus or that God doesn't love you. Don't ever think that God hasn't done enough for you. He did everything. He did everything for you so that you could have a life that is more abundant, a life of peace, happiness, fullness, life more abundantly to the highest degree, far over and above, superior and surpassing on this earth. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and what? Thy will be done on where? Earth, like it is where? In heaven. It was Jesus' prayer that your life on earth would be heaven on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wanted, Jesus wanted your life on earth to be like heaven on earth. Never, never, ever, 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 ever blame God. Understand who your enemy is. So again, go back to previous radio broadcasts, the archives, go back to the five week series on resurrection week is what it was called. It was a five week in-depth study of the suffering of Jesus that we call the great exchange. Go back to the beginning of the law of spiritual authority, where we talked about know your enemy, a study of who Satan is and what he does and what are his tactics. And who God is, what he does, and what are his tactics. And you'll find that God and Satan never change places. They never exchange roles. Neither does God hire the devil to do his dirty work. And there have been foolish Christians who have said such foolish things. That God would hire the devil to do his dirty work. That whenever God needed something bad done, he just called the devil to do it. That is an absolute lie from hell. Satan is self-employed. Satan has his own agenda. God has no dark side. In James, it said in James 1, that every good and perfect gift comes down from above. From the father of the heavenly lights in whom there is no darkness. There is no shadow of turning. There is no darkness in God. There is no dark side. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God is good. Psalm 119.68. God is good and what he does is good. There is no bad in him. God is love. There is no hate in him. God is good. There is no bad in him. God is light. There is no darkness in him. No shadow of turning. Everything he does is good all the time. And so never get confused about who your enemy is. Satan alone, self-employed is seeking whom he may devour. Again, listen to that one week teaching series. I mean, one week teaching that we did about six months ago called know your enemy, know the devil. If you don't know who your enemy is, and if you don't know his tactics, you'll never win. You know, every military army commander, They study the enemy. 
They study the maneuvers and the methods and the tactics of the army that they're fighting against. Every athletic team, especially you know this in, for example, football, and the coaches study the tactics and methods of their opposing team. Why? You've got to know the tactics and methods of your opponent, your enemy, in order to be able to overcome. Most Christians, sadly to say, most do not know the tactics of the enemy. They do not even know or much are not much aware of the enemy. And whenever there is something bad, they say, God, why did you do it? It wasn't God. When somebody dies, they cry over this loved one and they say, God, why did you kill him? Why did you take him? Why did you let him die in an accident? God didn't do it. Satan is the thief coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And you will never win the battle in life if you don't know your enemy, if you don't know his tactics. You will always be swinging In the wrong direction. You'll always be swinging out at God. Or at family members. And they're not the ones who are your problem. You have one enemy. One only. Satan. And of course his team. Of cohorts. The demons. Of uh, all those in the kingdom of darkness. But let me remind you. 1 Peter 5.8 1 Peter 5.8 Be self-controlled and alert. Be alert. Be knowledgeable. Be aware. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Let me say that again. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil. The devil. The Bible clearly says God told you who your enemy is. Your enemy, the devil, the devil, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Notice if he has to look for someone to devour, it means that he cannot just devour anyone Or everyone, he has to look. There are some he can devour and others he cannot devour. Why? Because some people know him and his tactics and he cannot devour them. He cannot devour those who know his tactics and are walking in the tactics and the ways of God. To overcome the devil. Satan cannot devour everyone. You don't have to be devoured. As I've said all through the last series. You don't have to be a victim. You don't have to be devoured. You don't have to be hurt. You have been given everything you need. To overcome. And so use it. Use it. In 2 Corinthians 2.11. 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. In order that Satan might not outwit us. See right here, God again tells us who our enemy is. Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And then Ephesians 6.12 Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not your mother, your father, your husband or your wife, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your coworker or your boss. Your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities And against the powers of this dark world or the darkness of this world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
So you must understand God is not your enemy. Your struggle is not against God. Your struggle is not against flesh and blood. Is not against your spouse or your boss, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this, the darkness of this world and spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. It is Satan in the kingdom of darkness. So for you to understand the spiritual battle, you must first understand your enemy. Who is your enemy and what are his tactics? And don't take for granted that you know there's a lot more for you to learn, a lot more for you to understand, for you to become a lot more effective in your fight of faith. Hallelujah. And so we know now there is in these verses, I want you to see who is your enemy. Your enemy is the devil. He has tactics. Second Corinthians two eleven. his schemes. There is a battle going on and a struggle, not against God, not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness. That is the kingdom of darkness, that that is where your struggle and your fight is. And then what do you do? What do you do to deal with the devil? Go back to first Peter five, nine, first Peter five, nine says, resist him. That is the devil. Verse eight says your enemy, the devil verse nine, resist him, resist the devil standing firm in the faith, standing firm in the faith, resist him. So what do you do? You resist him. James four, seven also James 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist him again. It says resist him in 1 Peter 5, 9, and it says resist him in James 4, 7. And Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 27 says, do not give the devil a foothold. And so our enemy is the devil. There is a spiritual battle going on. What kind of battle is this? Second Corinthians 10, second Corinthians 10 verses three and four, three and four. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Let me read that to you again in the King James. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we see that our battle, though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war after the flesh. Or as it says in another translation, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Our battle is a spiritual battle. So what do we do? We have to fight. What kind of a fight is our fight? It is a fight of faith. First Timothy 6.12. First Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of what is the fight of faith? First Timothy also again in chapter one, verse 18, first Timothy one eighteen. He said, I give you this instruction and in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by following them, you may fight the good fight. Well, what is the good fight? In verse eight, chapter one, verse 18, it's told us in chapter six, 12, the good fight is a fight of faith. The good fight is a fight of faith. Psalm 144 verse one. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle. Well, that was naturally speaking in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it is fulfilled by spiritual 
fighting, understanding the fight of faith. And so we must understand that we are in a battle. We, there is a war, as it says in second Corinthians 10, three waging war, but this war is not in the flesh. It is in the spirit. Who is our enemy? The devil is our enemy. What kind of fight is it? It is a fight of faith. What are, we're going to get later into what are our weapons? They are spiritual weapons. We will talk about those later. How do you deal with the devil? You resist him. You resist him. James, uh, first Peter five, nine and James four, seven. Also, you cast out the devil. Mark sixteen seventeen. in my name, they will cast out demons. You cast out the devil. So you resist him. And what else? You cast him out. You resist him and you cast him out. Matthew 18, 18, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. What else do you do? You bind him. You bind him. You resist him. You cast him out. You bind him. You resist him. You cast him out out and you will win the victory. I'm running out of time. Join me again tomorrow. Remember, God loves you. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.